Good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Dr. Kasekende, um, for some of us uh, bankers, where's Dr. Kasekende seated? Oh, there. For some of us bankers, uh, forgotten time is an opportunity cost, so I'll send my invoice <laughs> for five minutes, taking up of our time. But uh, without further ado, um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your um, attendance and the uh, attention that you will give to our panel. And um, uh, with the unpredictable uh, macroeconomic landscape and volatile uh, food and commodity prices that we're seeing uh, in the recent past, and currently, we will take a look at the macroeconomic and financial challenges in uncertain times such as this. We will delve into regional uh, economic view, uh, risks, and uh, perspective. And to deliberate on this uh, topic, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Mr. Tobias uh, Rasmussen, the resident uh, representative um, of uh, IMF uh, to Kenya. Welcome, sir. Mr. Ricardo Santos, the economist for the European Investment Bank. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Jonathan Pinifolo, the chief operating officer for the Comesa Business Council. Welcome. Okay. The Sub-Saharan Africa's recovery has been uh, abruptly disrupted. La last year, activity had uh, finally bounced back, lifting GDP growth in 2021 to about 4.6% of GDP. The expectation for uh, this year is that GDP will slightly slow down by just over 100 basis points to about 3.6%. This is stemming from a worldwide slowdown, tighter global financial conditions, and a dramatic pickup in global inflation, which we're expecting, obviously, will inadvertently spill over to the region that's already worried by an ongoing series of shocks. Rising food and energy prices are impacting the region's most vulnerable and public debt and inflation at levels we have not seen in this decade. Against this backdrop and with limited options, many countries find themselves pushed closer to the edge. The near-term outlook is extremely uncertain and region's prospects are tied to developments in the global economy with a number of countries facing difficult social, political and security situations at home. I would like to now invite Dr. Sorry, uh, Mr. Ramosen to speak to uh, what the macroeconomic picture looks like for the East Africa region. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, very good to be here and um, glad to have this opportunity. So as um, Mwale was laying out the, the challenges, I'll and, and the regional economic outlook. I'll, I'll dig more into some of this. Um, I have a few slides. I hope they're up on, on the screen. Thank you. Uh, so this is from our regional economic outlook. It's a publication we put out every six months looking at sub-Saharan Africa. This uh, last version came out in uh, late October, so still quite fresh. Now, as backdrop uh, for what is happening in, in the region, um, here just a, a summary of how we see developments at the global level. So in, indeed, uh, we're seeing a, a quite significant slowdown in economic growth worldwide. Um, this follows in 2021, there was a a pronounced rebound in activity following the, the pandemic. Uh, so some deceleration uh, from that level was, uh, was expected. But above and beyond the slowdown that was expected, we've had now a, a, a series of, of, of shocks in the global economy and as a result uh, are, are seeing quite marked further downward revisions of, of growth. The table here shows how our current projections for this year and next compared to what was projected uh, back in, in April. Overall, global economic growth projected at 3.2% this year, 
uh, that's down 0.4 percentage points from the, the earlier projection. And looking into 2023, we expect further deceleration of, of, of growth. Um, for emerging and, and developing economies, the, the slowdown is not quite as sharp as it is for the advanced economies. And if we look further within this part of the world, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the, the deceleration or the, the, the downward revisions of, of growth are, are even smaller yet. And especially this region, this sub-region, uh, East African community and, and, and Kenya, we're actually seeing that uh, growth has been quite resilient. Um, we're maintaining growth levels of around 5% uh, this year and, and projecting the same level broadly uh, next year. It's still somewhat of a downward revision from earlier, but overall uh, this sub-region here is holding up quite well. Now, what's behind that downward revision of, of growth globally? Um, big shocks. We had, of course, the, the war in Ukraine uh, back in, in, in February. It sparked massive increases in, in commodity prices, uh, fuel, food, fertilizer, also prices uh, going up very sharply, uh, wheat even more so. Um, and while prices of, of these commodities have gradually come down from their peaks, they're still quite elevated and it, it's been a very volatile environment. Those higher prices uh, have fed into inflation. <coughs> Globally, as, as was mentioned, we're looking at uh, inflation levels that we haven't seen for, for decades. Um, and the acceleration in, in prices, in particular in, in advanced economies, has, has been very sharp. But also in this region, we've seen prices going up. Um, this has created hardships uh, for populations facing higher food prices, higher fuel prices. It's also uh, impacted on external positions, uh, translating into much higher import bills. Also, what we've been seeing, uh, and, and this is partly a result of, of the inflation, because in response to the, the higher inflation, uh, countries around the world, and in particular advanced economies, have uh, tightened monetary policy, have raised interest rates to counter those price pressures. A consequence of that has been a flight uh, to safety, move to the US dollar, uh, and as a result, we've seen much less capital inflow, in fact, capital outflow uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in Kenya in particular, we, we felt this last year. Uh, there was a plan for a uh, $1.1 billion euro bond issuance. Uh, the market was simply not available for that. Uh, financing conditions became very tight indeed. Also, a pressure across countries uh, th that predates uh, these recent round of shocks and in fact goes back to around 2005 or so uh, has been on the fiscal side. Uh, we've seen debt to GDP ratios climb across countries. Um, debt servicing costs have increased and many more countries are facing debt burdens that are, are becoming 
uh, difficult to manage. Uh, we have in the chart there on, on the right uh, how countries uh, are ranked by, by us in our debt sustainability analysis that we do together with uh, the World Bank for their risks of, uh, of debt distress. And, and clearly it's become a much more pressured environment there. So what does this mean for, for policy making? Um, well, three issues that we have pointed to in, in our regional economic outlook is, of course, in, in, in the near term, the need to fight fires, uh, counter these shocks we've had in, in, in the region here, uh, a, a confluence of, of shocks. Uh, the, the higher prices of, of essential goods, the more distressed financing conditions, and, and we also have a, a drought to, to contend with. Uh, so all these areas require uh, urgent responses. At, at the same time, um, we're seeing that the scope, the space for responding to these shocks has been very limited, in particular on, on the fiscal side, given the, the high debt levels. So from that, uh, a, a need to build resilience, to build buffers, and also a need to gear policy towards moving away from, from the edge, as, as we call it, uh, stimulating growth, addressing macroeconomic imbalances, uh, all as a way of, of uh, putting countries in, in a position where when shocks happen, uh, the, the consequences are, are not so severe and, and there is more room to, to respond. Four main policy priorities as, as we see them right at, at this juncture is one, uh, address food insecurity, which is a significant problem for many countries. Uh, the, the higher prices, of course, uh, but also in, in, in this region at least, uh, the, the severe drought conditions. Um, the, the region here is facing the, the worst drought in, in 40 years. In, in doing so, um, it'll be important to allow prices to, to pass through uh, to consumers, but doing so in a, in a way where you protect the, the most vulnerable. There is a, a balancing act here. Um, what you really want is to provide support in, in the most targeted way to the, the most vulnerable groups. Uh, but reaching those uh, vulnerable groups can be, be difficult. It can be more, uh, more quick to, to simply roll out blanket subsidies. Many countries have, have done so. Um, but these subsidies can also be extremely costly. Uh, we've seen that in, in Kenya with fuel subsidies uh, which ballooned this year and uh, came to a level where uh, it was deemed unsustainable and uh, eventually they uh, were removed. So you want to provide that support but do it in, in, in the most targeted way possible and, and where emergency measures have been introduced that perhaps are not so targeted, you, you want to, to phase those out. A second uh, priority is consolidating public finances, um, stabilizing those high debt levels and moving to a situation where uh, the debt to GDP ratios actually st start uh, declining will be important. That will require boosting revenue uh, as well as prioritizing spending.
then uh, need as a third priority need to manage the shift in, in monetary policy. Uh, this is happening globally uh, with the rise in, in inflation. Um, in this part of the world, it, it's, it's a somewhat different dynamic than in advanced economies. Uh, the inflation is not so much driven by demand pressures. Uh, it, it's more on, on the supply side that you've seen these shocks that have caused higher prices. But you also have the added element of, of, uh, of the impact on the external position of, of countries, as we've seen with uh, the, the, reduce, the reduction in capital inflows, uh, that having gaps between uh, interest rates in advanced economies and, and, and locally can cause these capital outflows. So you, you want to uh, maintain that, that balance. There is pressure to, to raise interest rates in, in, in this environment, even if uh, the inflation that we're seeing is, uh, is perhaps not as much demand driven as it is in advanced economies. And then finally, as a fourth priority, uh, the need to foster sustainable and, and, and greener growth. Um, robust sustainable growth is, is critical, uh, including to put in place uh, the, 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 the foundations for revenue mobilization for government, which is so important to uh, to address those those debt pressures uh, but also greener growth uh, given how we are seeing climate change impacting this region um, contributing to the the food insecurity there is a need to invest in in green infrastructure build resilience uh, here this is an area where um, the region also has a lot of growth opportunities. Um, looking specifically at, at, at Kenya, uh, huge potential, for example, in geothermal energy. Uh, there, there are lots of, of growth opportunities in, in these areas, as well as challenges. So let me end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. So um, I'm sure what we're thinking is, you know, how do these uh, shocks uh, impact the, the region? And uh, what comes to mind, of course, is um, how are these uh, shocks? And uh, also, we're not given that we're not immune to what's happening the, in the, uh, the development on the global economic landscape. How, do these, uh, how are these shocks uh, impacting um, the, the banking sector uh, within uh, East Africa? And um, Ricardo, do you see this uh, translating into different lending standards for the banks? I'll try to answer that <laughs> in a few slides in this presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here and uh, now in person again. Um, can I just have the pointer, please? Yes, thanks. So uh, my uh, try to be as brief as possible. I'll, you know, I'll follow up on what Tobias was presenting before and to uh, to explain how the macro backdrop translates into the banking sector performance. To do that, I will uh, use a lot on our recently re uh, released publication that we have some copies uh, outside, um, if you want to read, uh, which is the finance in Africa. This is now the seventh year that we are publishing it. It has a survey now of 70 banks, including 20 um, in East Africa. And then here we combine uh, this survey with some data um, that give us an overview of the, the banking sectors in the, the financial sectors in the, in the region. And we include some thematic um, analysis as well that I'll explain uh, later. So the way that we see the, the, um, the macroeconomic backdrop influencing banks is through tighter uh, financing conditions. Uh, I mean, I have there two chart. The first chart shows that clearly. 
we see that the, the risks uh, uh, to the sovereigns have increased as measured by the markets. The CDS spreads, uh, that would be a good metric to, to measure it, they didn't increase as much as they did during COVID, um, but they are not declining as fast as they did during COVID. So COVID was a, you know, a, a quick shock, the market recovered. Now the perception of risks towards the sovereigns is taking more time to recover. Why? The answer is in the chart there on the, on the right, is because there are some fundamental factors as Tobias was, Tobia was, was mentioning. Um, you know, uh, there we show the, the, um, the, the ratio of the debt service, so the interest payments that the sovereign has have as a share of their revenues, and it's been like on an upward trend over the past 10 years in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's increasing this pace of, um, uh, um, of increase. So sovereigns are more exposed to this, and even if some sovereigns are, you know, they are not, they don't have foreign currency uh, debt, they'll still be uh, impacted by the fact that purely the interest, uh, interest rates are increasing and so are the costs to them, to the sovereign. And banks told us that this is already having an impact on their, um, on their operations and they expect this to, to have a further impact um, in the next year. We asked banks, you know, what are their main concerns um, in terms of, of operations? Um, in East Africa, almost 90% of the banks said that the increasing costs in local currency are their main concern. Um, this is also the main concern in, in Sub-Saharan Africa as well, but it's uh, far more important in, in, in East Africa. And then asset quality comes as a second. So, you know, the impact of this macroeconomic slowdown in terms of, of increasing NPLs is not as important as the funding costs. Um, the, the, the share is also smaller for Sub-Saharan Africa. Where there is an interesting distinction here is that when we also, uh, one of the options that we ask the banks is that to what extent competition from fintechs is a risk to their activity. I mean, although in the first panel, <laughs> and the, like the people on the ground were saying that this was a main concern to us, <laughs> what they told us is that it's like the number three and in sub-Saharan Africa it's probably, you know, tied as the, as the first concern. But then how does actually then East Africa uh, uh, is currently in terms of uh, of data. So, wh what are the, the the what is the footing of the of the banking sector in East Africa? We see there in the chart on the left that actually it's in a better position when compared to the other subregions in the continent. So, both in terms of capital ratios, profitability, and also in terms of NPLs, or I would say even in especially in terms of NPLs, East Africa is in a better footing when compared to the other regions in the continent. I mean, uh, capital ratios are at 19% on average for, for the, the region, profitability almost at 20%, and the NPL's ratios, I mean, are higher than, than, than um, other developing uh, regions or emerging markets, but still lower um, than um, other sub-regions in the continent. However, there is like a, this should be taken with a pinch of salt, is that when you see then on a chart on your right, this aggregate picture, especially for the NPLs, masks some uh, differences across the, 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 um, the region. I show there like the, the, the most active uh, economies in terms of financial sector, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. And I mean, it, it's striking to see that NPL ratio is almost double in, in Kenya than it is in other, in other of these countries in the region. And it's been um, trending upward. And now going finally to your question, how does this <laughs> impact the, the tightening standards? Um, you see, so first turn on the charts on your left, that over the past 12 months, you know, banks in East Africa, at least the ones that report to our survey, and this is survey data, uh, have been tightening their uh, lending conditions to, to SMEs and to corporates, broadly in line with in Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole. However, in the next 12 months, and this is quite surprising, they s expect some slight easing, I would say, uh, as you can see there on, on, on the, the two bars on, on the right, uh, especially, and that's even more striking when compared with the average of sub-Saharan Africa. Here, I mean, I would still, and this is our survey, I should say great things about it, I do, but I would take this with a pinch of salt, right? Because if you see like the green bars are, uh, the, or the, the, the green bars are big, but then they are about the same size as the red ones that show that banks expect tightening of conditions. And I mean, this tells us that, you know, the persistence of the COVID shock and the current macroeconomic shock is still here. So although banks might, you know, felt some opt uh, few optimism a few months ago, I would take this with a pinch of salt. And here I would go now also to more structural um, f features of the, the, the banking sector. 
that are you know impacted by the current um, background but uh, um, are not you know as uh, uh, probably seen are not going to be seen in the next year or so first with digital I mean the the, the, the first thing that came, comes into everyone's mind it was already discussed in the previous panel um, now in this case we are completely aligned with the discussion before COVID increased a lot digitalization uh, not only in terms of having more services available uh, but then also in terms of uh, accelerated the, the transformation however uh, I mean by having like this uh, big change it also increases challenges to banks and we see still there on the chart on the left that banks now have an increasing focus on cybersecurity. there's going to be a, 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 a panel on, on the tomorrow uh, also in the conference but I mean it's, it's everywhere it's in East Africa it's sub-Saharan Africa everywhere um, and um, when we uh, uh, ask then the banks what are what are the main obstacles you know for them to do more in terms of digital cybersecurity again is the top then also requirements in terms of uh, know your client as well and regulation uh, also infrastructure you know the need to invest more in IT infrastructure at 10 as I was as mentioned in the beginning competition from telecoms and some other fintechs interestingly enough but it's still quite <coughs> relevant around half of the banks say that you'll need funding to 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 meet these investments then green um, we have seen and this is starting you know, with the chart on the left that banks are also increases are not only uh, um, you know increasing the the the, um, the monitoring or, or or putting climate risk considerations into new loans that's the two bars there on the um, on on the chart on the left but they are also increasingly doing that uh, to the existing portfolio and if they don't do they say that they they tend to do uh, so almost eighty percent of the banks say that they they either do or they intend to do and this is quite sizable when you compare to last year when I mean we had more or less the same share of banks saying that they are doing but they, are, they didn't see that as an urgent need so then we also asked them you know what is keeping you from doing that 60% of the banks so here the, they don't report an issue with funding so 60% of the banks said that they lack the technical capacity to do so and this is I mean there are other surveys out there not on Africa but in, in, in even in developed regions and this is more or less I think a, a, a common feature uh, and then 67% of the banks think that IFIs, like you, the, the IB and others, could support uh, in terms of providing this uh, technical capacity and expanding their uh, um, capacity not only to provide green lending, but also to assess the risks to, to green lending. And then uh, last but, but not least also, we, have a, we didn't have a dedicated chapter, but a, a, a big uh, chunk of one, on gender, we'll have one uh, in the next year edition. Um, we also asked banks, you know, if they have a gender uh, strategy in place. 70% uh, said so, and this is a 10 percentage point increase from what they've reported last year. And 60%, or roughly 60%, say that they offer targeted services to um, women-led business. And this is also like a, 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 an interesting feature. Um, 40% of the respondents to the survey uh, say that uh, NPL rates are lower in female-led business than in male-led business. Of course, then one, one can, can uh, think about reasons for this. It was something that we'll try to devote more uh, into the next year's publication, but it's also still an interesting feature. So I'll stop here, and I hope that I'll answer the questions, and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Um, Again, um, right now I'm thinking, okay, uh, how do I bring this closer to home? What does it mean uh, for the price of my, my Ugali? Um, how do I explain this to my, my grandmother in terms of you know, what the impact will be for her? Um, so in terms of obviously what we've been seeing is the escalating uh, prices of our commodities, such as your fuel, um, your, your wheat, your soya. Um, how can we leverage uh, on uh, supply chain financing to mitigate some of these uh, shocks that we're seeing, that, uh, that we're experiencing at the moment? Jonathan, would you like to share more on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, so essentially, probably before I go into, uh, to answer the question, um, I would first maybe look at a few uh, challenges in as far as uh, supply chain is concerned. So uh, number one, we are talking of issues like, for instance, uh, poor infrastructure, uh, uh, de we, are, we have corridors which are not developed. So essentially what this means is to say that um, it will take probably a small cost to transfer maybe to transport a car from Japan 
I mean, to transport uh, a car within Africa, but when you are transporting a car from Japan, it's cheaper. Secondly, we are looking at challenges like, for instance, uh, access to finance. This has been talked a lot. Uh, most, uh, if you look at the private sector, more especially the MSMEs, do have challenges when it comes to access to finance. Um, we did a study, uh, like in 2019, where we noted that when it comes to cross-border MSMEs, only 13% of them uh, do have access to formal, um, financial, formal loans from financial services. Again, there are other aspects, like for instance, um, uh, lack of industrialization, more in particular green industrialization. These are also affecting um, um, supply chains. And also we are talking of issues like, for instance, agricultural production. So what we're saying is, uh, to answer your question is to say, we can only leverage uh, on the, through the African continent of free trade area. So essentially this is going to control prices of commodities, like for instance, you've talked about wheat, uh, soya, and also at the same time this is going to bring in um, a big um, a global uh, structural uh, supply chain in as far as uh, production is concerned. And at the same time, it's also going to <coughs> create some production networks within Africa. Uh, I think finally, uh, what I can say also is probably to focus on the secular economy. I think there, there's been, there was a talk on the green bond infrastructure perspective. So what we're saying is, I think it's also important to make sure that uh, uh, we recycle the products. We have to see how best do we incentivize when people are investing and the like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Now, what's been a thematic across uh, Africa and, uh, and what we see East Africa driving quite aggressively is uh, digitization of trade. How do you see us moving forward or even better implementing the digital solutions that we, we already have in the market to mitigate some of the uh, challenges, the shocks that we're currently experiencing? Uh, thank you very much. So in as far as uh, digitization is concerned, I think I would say that uh, digital trade is very critical indeed uh, in the sense that it opens up uh, so many opportunities. If you look at uh, what happened during the COVID-19, I think uh, borders were closed, people were not moving across the borders, and this also uh, led to the increase of uh, uh, use of digital platforms. People were able to check uh, or access market information uh, through digital platforms. And at the same time, um, what we're saying is, I think with the digital platforms, I think other speakers also have already pointed out, they will help um, to promote uh, issues like, for instance, access to market intelligence. So you don't need to travel to know maybe what's the price of uh, a commodity in a particular market. You just have to go into your computer and check uh, what is being uh, sold. Uh, at the same time, uh, what we're saying is it also makes uh, um, the cost of doing business cheaper, I think, uh, from the, what we had heard from the Bank of Rwanda. Um, uh, our colleague, the previous speaker, talked about how this is driving down uh, the cost of doing business. And uh, finally, I would say that uh, I think when you look at probably the fourth industrial revolution, I think this is going to, this is going to bring on board uh, quite a number of sustainable um, uh, solutions uh, within the sector, uh, within trade, in as far as trade is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, now, with what uh, Ricardo had mentioned, that uh, we're likely, most likely, to see easing of lending standards. I hope I captured that uh, correctly, um, uh, Ricardo. At least easing of standards to to some extent. How can that uh, then uh, translate into increased uh, access to financing? Do you see that happening in the current environment, uh, Jonathan? Yes. So I think um, I would see that happening in the current environment. Uh, or what is supposed to be done is probably to uh, put in place deliberate policies uh, that will help uh, in as far as um, access to finance is concerned. So um, if we, uh, what we're saying is if we're going to prohibit access to finance, we are also maybe constraining uh, production, we are constraining supply and even demand as well. So we, I would say, I would see this happening, but the most important thing is number one, to have uh, those uh, Enable, to have an enabling environment, but also even when you look at the <coughs> uh, development um, uh, finance institutions, I think there is also need to refocus on the way uh, uh, financing is going to be done, so that there is now support for uh, maybe green industri industrial growth, as I mentioned earlier. I want to say I think green industrial growth is also 
one of the important aspects that needs to be considered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm sure there's some burning questions from the audience uh, that you'd like to pose to the panelists. I now welcome the uh, questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my question would go to Ricardo Santos, the presentation that you shared around uh, the macro environment. Uh, you talked about the pressure that sovereigns are facing, uh, even in terms of uh, local currency uh, borrowing and the competition for local currency uh, with commercial banks. I just want to ask, how do you see that playing out uh, in terms of the competition between sovereigns uh, and commercial banks uh, for depositor money? Uh, and in terms of what, you know, what does that mean for, for bank growth, for cost of capital, for availability of credit, et cetera? Thank you. Um, well, I think we'll take a question at a time and uh, respond. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, well, I guess that there are Two, two layers to that um, to that issue. First is when you, as you were pointing, there is indeed a, a, an issue of competition. So, per se, the banks to attract capital have to increase their um, the interest rates that they offer for their investors to compete with them with the sovereign. But then, even on the side of the, um, then on, on the actual transmission of that to the to the corporates, um, it will result in, in higher cost of funding to the um, to the client. So. Banks will have no longer, no, not only to increase their their costs, but will have to try to pass more costs to their clients. And this is in a period where inflation uh, is driving up the, the, the um, all the, the the costs that the corporates are are facing. So there is uh, not just per se the impact of that um, of that, but then also the impact of the, the fact that this happens in an environment where the, uh, the other costs are are increasing. So. The likely uh, result of this will be uh, probably slower credit growth uh, going forward. Um, as I was uh, mentioning before, it's curious that we saw that in East Africa, the banks are not reporting tighter credit conditions, um, or they even expect some easing, but um, we didn't ask. It's something that surely we're going to add in the next uh, year uh, survey in terms of the pricing. So probably this means that banks will not have tighter credit conditions, but you know, they'll increase costs, even if they don't consider that uh, that's a tighter credit condition. So it in turn will also um, mean uh, probably less demand from, from corporates and SMEs. Thank you. We can take another question. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Carmelo Kokusa from the European Investment Bank. Um, my question is concerning NPL levels. We've seen and you show very clearly, Ricardo, that NPL levels are higher in Kenya than they are in the other rest, in the rest of the region. And we heard from Royal Bank uh, earlier and the Bank of Kigali that there is already a way of segregating NPLs from women, uh, women borrowing and uh, sort of men borrowing, uh, so that there's a high level of segregation. Is it also possible to segregate NPLs from uh, fintechs and financial? Um, sort of the, the financial platform, digital platforms that are emerging. And we see Kenya, obviously, as being one of the most prominent in the use of digital platforms for, for lending purposes. Could it be possible to already to segregate and find the sources of these NPLs, whether they are led by the commercial banks on traditional lending activities, or they're also caused by the higher level of financial um, or digital payment systems? Uh, I think that uh, even uh, it might be available in Kenya because there was uh, the, the, there were some talks about some service. But even if the, there is no um, uh, uh, possible discrimination between fintechs or um, or that kind of lending and normal lending, I mean, a good proxy could be consumer lo loans, right? You see the NPLs in consumer loans that are increasing faster than um, residential and in, 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 in corporate NPLs. Um, we saw that. I cannot say across the region, but definitely in, in Kenya and, and Uganda and Rwanda. Okay. Thank you, Ricardo. I think we'll take a question from the back. I think that's Mr. Bosser. No, it's not. He's Sorry. disappeared. Okay. Everybody <laughs> thinks I'm his twin, Apologies. but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tom Lawton. I'm from TLT. Um, 
Ricardo, I just want to echo your comments about the, the pricing structure, particularly in the Kenyan market. It's recently been announced that a number of the tier one banks are pricing for risk as from beginning of next year. One bank is talking about 13.5 going to 18.5. It's a huge increase. Um, the effect on lending at that stage is going to be enormous. The NPL situation or debt service capacity will decline. Yeah, so that's one of the, the areas that I think that your survey at that time wasn't in place, but CBK have been pushing for this pricing for risk at a time when the, the, the uh, new name for it is perma-crisis, by the way. That's in the Oxford English Dictionary as of this year of what's happening on a global basis. But with the perma-crisis taking place, with people's disposable incomes going down because of inflation and everything else, then interest rates go up, as Mr. McCorber would say, result misery. Yeah, so it's a very difficult situation, and I think the timing of the pricing for risk <laughs> could be better. Yeah, it's just to share that uh, with you, because I think the NPL situation, um, as we know, can be adjusted yeah, when reporting. For example, this quarter, the Q3 results for the Tier 1 banks in Kenya show a 1% reduction down to 13.6, but that's caused by write-offs. There's no actual improvement in the NPL, it's actual self. So uh, we're in for tough times, yeah, as lenders, yeah, from the perma crisis. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you for sharing that insight. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm John Esther from TDB. Uh, talking about tough times, uh, we heard earlier that uh, there appears to be a flight to quality, and in particular to the USD. Uh, but I remember reading a few weeks ago in The Economist that the US dollar is probably currently overvalued by as much as 25%. So are we not staring some more misery down the road? I'll ask uh, Tobias to take that question, if that's all right. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I think we saw really a, a peak of tension in, in global markets uh, around the middle of, of this year um, with both the, the commodity prices and, and uh, also several financial market indicators, for example, uh, spreads on, on Kenya's euro bonds uh, went sky high around uh, early July. I, I, I think generally we've seen some moderation actually since then. Um, whether it's durable or not, we'll, we'll see, but there seems to have been some calming uh, going on in, in, in markets and also on, on the dollar side. Uh, in, in recent weeks, we, we've seen some reversal of, of that earlier sharp appreciation of, of the dollar. So I, I, I think this is all good news for countries in, in the region here. Uh, those pressures, in, including the, the stronger dollar and, and what it meant for, for debt servicing costs, uh, w was definitely a, a, a pressure point. So, I mean, I, 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 I would perhaps take a more optimistic note on, on that, seeing that things look to be moving in, in a better direction, but of course, whether it, it's sustainable, whether it's durable is, is a question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, my name is Ruja Johnstone. I'm from um, FAO Investment Center. My question is about agricultural finance. And in the current climate that was just described, how would bank service the need for increased agricultural lending when we're facing also an increasing risk to the agricultural sector with regards to climate change. 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Jonathan, would you like to tackle that one? Yes. Uh, so, in terms of um, uh, agricultural financing, I think um, if you look at the bottom of the financial, maybe pyramid, more especially the MSMEs or also some of the farmers, I think uh, the most important thing would be, I think, would also to focus on the collaterals, like uh, what sort of collaterals need to be put in place. I think before funds are being pumped into such uh, uh, big projects. Uh, so I think uh, collaterals, we'll look at collaterals. Um, at the same time, uh, also, I think um, what would be important also is for maybe even for farmers, probably they form like uh, groups, uh, consortiums, whereby that will also give uh, probably some uh, trust uh, in the lenders to, to give out such. Thank you. Yep, if I could just add with something that we had from our survey is that the, I think there is a positive aspect in the fact that the banks are saying that they are increasing the monitoring of climate risk in their portfolio. So it's not just the fact that you know they are looking at uh, all the, the, um, the loans and try to see what is climate and increasing the, the provisioning or reducing then the loans to the sector. I think that if you evaluate better your risk, it means that you can assess better your projects and then you actually then and you, you become more, more confident instead of saying this is climate or this is agriculture, you know, I'm going to increase my provisioning here. I think this is, this is quite a, a good thing that there is a, a will from the, the banks to do this. And of course they say that they need, they lack cap uh, technical capacity, but there are tools to, to compensate that. Thank you. Two questions uh, that have come through on the chat from our online participants. Uh, the first one, I believe, is for Mr. Rasmussen. Uh, this one is about cryptocurrency. My name is James Kapale from the Republic of Malawi, and my question uh, is on the use of cryptocurrency in this part of Africa. I think in the context of the risks that you've talked about and uh, financing going forward, uh, might cryptocurrency have a, a role to play? The second question would go to Ricardo Santos. What, in your opinion, uh, what is your opinion on the liberalization of the banking sector for foreign banks, the effect of macro level and financial risks for local banks? And this is in the context of Ethiopia, which has recently announced uh, a major policy change in that respect. And that is from Mr. Bahiru in uh, Ethiopia. Thank you. Should I? Uh, give a stab at the one on cryptocurrency. So, so we've seen in, in recent weeks that confidence in, in, in the whole asset class of, of cryptocurrencies has, has really suffered. Um, I think this has made clear the, the risks involved uh, and Underlying that, I, I think also I exposed really sort of the the, the, the question of, of what are these products really meant to, to serve. Uh, I, I think the answers uh, to that are, are still not that apparent. Uh, and, and the whole market uh, really has been uh, in, in a downturn. So I'm, I'm not sure really uh, if the future there is, is particularly bright, uh, but two things that stand out, I, I, I think, are uh, the very high risks in, involved, the, the need for, for caution, uh, and, and also the need for regulation, uh, protection of, of uh, investors, of, of consumers. So on, on the second question, well, I think that the, um, the liberalization of the Ethiopian market was like something that has been uh, in the cards for uh, a long time now, and it was even part of the, the conditionality from the IMF program uh, that then expired. So it's, it's good that it's going forward, um, and concentration and lack of competition is a big problem in, in, in Ethiopia, so you know uh, everything that is done to foster competition 
will in turn lead to lower interest rates and, and, and help access to finance in the country. The problem is now is of course the timing, right? Doing uh, this liberalization in the time where the, the interest rates are going up in the US as they are going, as the US dollar has been appreciating as it was been uh, discussed before, it increases the risks to, to, to the macroeconomic stability, but I guess it's, I mean, uh, given like, the, the, the two things, it's better to advance and then to, to manage those risks. I mean, with the macro prudential tools that are available for the central banks, being controlling the, 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 the amount of currency that is, uh, that is used and even managing the, the banking licenses that are provided. I think that here, it's still better to err on, on, the, on the side of, of liberalizing and, and, and increasing competition in the market. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias and uh, Ricardo. Any other questions? Okay. I okay, please come through. Yeah, two questions either to Ricardo uh, or Tobias. My name is Gerardo Soro. Um, there is a big debate around uh, the dollar and uh, how it influences global financial flows. But there's one aspect that has not been touched, and that is how the dollar influences terms of trade uh, because of the invoicing currency of many economies, including African economies. How is that playing out, considering the view that uh, there is um, talk about the US monetary policy being more tighter than is reported or than is reflected by the federal fund rate? Uh, and the reason why people argue that it's tighter is because the forward, the forward signal, I mean, the forward guidance uh, has been built uh, into the expectations of how monetary policy will evolve, and therefore the feeling that you know a shadow uh, monetary policy rate is probably much higher than the federal fund rate, and that has implications not just on financial flows, but also on the terms of trade, considering that many of the countries invoice in US dollars. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so I, I, I think one issue in, in, in this whole question of, of monetary policy re response uh, to the environment we, we're, we're seeing is, is countries individually, central banks, they, they primarily look at conditions in, in their own economies. Uh, they, they look at the inflation pressures and they uh, take monetary policy action accordingly. But what we're also seeing in, 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 in this environment is, is where uh, key economies such as, as the US uh, play such an outsized role in, in, in the global financial system. Uh, they are tightening monetary policy, uh, perhaps primarily because of domestic developments, but it does have spillover implications on the world, um, and perhaps uh, nowhere is that felt as, as much as, as as in this part of the world. Um, so, I I I I think what one would like to see is, is, is recognition of, of these spillovers, that it, it sort of is, is factored into decision making. I, I, th I think that does happen to, to some extent, but uh, it is a interconnected world and, and, and uh, there are important spillovers there. Um, so maybe that, that's just a comment I would make. Thank you. Any other questions? Have we exhausted all the burning questions? Okay, maybe just one uh, brief comment from me um, in line with the, the question that was raised by the lady from FAO uh, regarding um, uh, access to financing for um, maybe the agriculture sector. Um, much as, uh, yes, uh, we are concerned with the escalating uh, commodity prices, but I also see a silver lining uh, in uh, given the current uh, what might seemingly be 
um, of great concern and adverse uh, economic, uh, macroeconomic uh, environment. But there's a silver lining in the sense that um, this is where maybe um, as East, East Africa or Africa as a continent, uh, we should uh, step up, uh, make more concerted effort uh, with uh, boosting uh, intra-Africa trade, uh, particularly with agricultural commodities. Um, for example, Kenya being, uh, Kenya has uh, the, the largest contributor to GDP, it comes from the agriculture sector. Uh, we have a number, uh, you know, large volumes of um, agriculture grains coming out of uh, Southern Africa, for example, like uh, Zambia. Uh, where you know th there's maize, uh, or there's always a, a you know for the past um, few years uh, there's been a bumper harvest um, that we can uh, look at with respect to you know boosting into Africa trade for for hard grains. Um, coming back to East Africa, um, there are various agricultural commodities uh, that come out of out of uh, East Africa where we can look at how then do we reinforce um, the off takers. Um, for the various uh, commodities uh, from uh, East Africa, Kenya to be specific, which is um, a, a hub for, for your coffee, your teas. There's Ghana, uh, when we talk about uh, cocoa, co uh, cocoa. And um, there are various commodities that we can look at where we can capitalize and also um, see how best we can mitigate or rather uh, reduce the impact of the shocks that we're currently seeing on the landscape. Thank you. Um, I believe uh, there are no other uh, questions. Okay, happy to, to end here. Just to say a big thank you uh, to the panelists uh, for uh, this uh, discussion and for sharing uh, the great insights. <laughs>